Hello. In this video, Tony and I will provide an introduction to the 17th edition of the IEE wiring regulations. For those of you watching only to find out about Amendment 1 changes, keep an eye out for the little green book symbol. That will highlight Amendment 1 content. One thing that becomes very apparent is that for some topics you can spend a lot of time flipping pages and chapters of the book as some regulations cross-reference with other regulations. It can be very confusing and therefore it's vital that to navigate successfully around the regs you have a good understanding of the numbering system used throughout. So, for example, if we look at a regulation in Part 4, Regulation 433.1.1, the first three digits, 433, tell us that the regulation is in Part 4, Protection for Safety, Chapter 43, Protection Against Overcurrent, Section 433. For example, the characteristics of supply and nature of demand, which would need to be determined at the earliest stages of installation design, are dealt with in more detail in Part 3, Assessment of General Characteristics. Other sections of Part 1 introduce the fundamental requirements for the selection of electrical equipment, its erection and the initial verification of the electrical installation before it's finally put into service, as well as requirements for periodic inspection and testing. Again, these sections are expanded in Parts 5 and 6, or for special installations and locations in Part 7. There is also provision within the regulations for the use of new technologies or inventions, which may lead to departures from the standard as long as safety isn't compromised. Another very important requirement for alteration and additions to an installation has also been moved with Amendment 1. And this requires that the rating and condition... A main equipotential bonding conductor is now referred to as a main protective bonding conductor. And supplementary equipotential bonding conductors are now just supplementary bonding conductors. Anything else, Tony? I'd just like to point out that with Amendment number 1, the supply system diagrams for TT, TNCS and the like have been moved from the definitions and are now Second placed in part in three. Distribution board. The it is also necessary to reduce the possibility of unwanted tripping of RCDs, for example from excessive protective conductor currents which we'll examine in part five. Section 312 was updated with the release of amendment number one to help clarify and identify installation conductor arrangements example, and system earthing, of RCDs, as well as which protect against earth fault currents. It's important to understand that RCDs do not provide protection against overload and short circuit currents. Table 41.1 lists the maximum disconnection times for both TN and TT systems for final circuits rated up to 32 amperes. So, for example, for a TN system rated at 230 volts AC, the maximum allowed disconnection time is 0.4 of a second. To achieve this disconnection time, different types of circuit protective devices will require different levels of fault current. There are time current characteristic graphs shown in Appendix 3. So, for example, a BS88 rated fuse at 100 amperes would actually need about 1000 amps of fault current to operate in 0.4 of a second. To ensure that a fault current is of sufficient magnitude to operate the circuit protective device in the required time, when discussing building occupancy with regard to evacuation, section 422 does refer to the external influence code we discussed earlier. For example, BD4 would be high density occupation with difficult conditions of evacuation. So as not to add to the danger during an evacuation, the wiring systems should generally not encroach upon the escape route unless they meet the requirements listed. For example, being placed beyond arm's reach and having protection against mechanical damage. There are also special requirements for cables used to supply safety services. This includes manufacture and testing requirements to ensure slow flame propagation and a limited rate of smoke production. Section 422.6 lists additional measures which may be considered for use in electrical installations in locations of national, commercial, industrial... It's also important to realise that the consequences of an overvoltage can be widespread. For example, a direct strike on a house once caused every telecom installation in a village to be wiped out. And recognising this, the 17th edition advises a risk assessment method as an alternative to the 25 thunderstorms criteria. So when you consider the consequences and the fact that surge protection is easy and cheap to install, 
especially compared to the cost of a rewire or a new TV, then installing it makes an awful lot of sense. We should just point out that a lightning protection system, as you'll find on a cathedral, only protects the building from physical damage by providing a path for the lightning to go to earth. To prevent this lightning entering back into the building via its electrical installation, surge protective devices need to be installed. We'll discuss this further when we examine section 534. The last section to look at in chapter 4.4 is section 4. There are several types of earth electrodes recognised for the purposes of the regulations. However, a metallic pipe for gases or flammable liquids shall not be used as an earth electrode. To comply with BS 7671, the designer is required to determine the cross-sectional area of protective conductors other than equipotential bonding conductors. This can either be by calculation or selection using table 54.7. Initial verification applies to new installation work or for an alteration to an existing installation, both of which must be verified for compliance with BS 7671 before being put into service. The initial verification should be carried out throughout the erection process before covers are replaced and installed wiring systems concealed. It's also important that the person doing the initial verification has information on the design Another of the major change from PIRs is that for electrical installation condition reports, it's not only necessary for the person carrying out the report to clearly document the agreed limitations, but to now include the reason for the limitations and also who it was agreed with. I must also mention here that we now have operational limitations as well. So a limitation not Specific agreed beforehand. for measuring zones, so that it's possible to determine them for particular locations. Examining the basic layout, we can see that zone zero is an area where total immersion within water is possible, and the risk of danger from electric shock is at its highest. When selecting equipment to be installed, it must have a minimum degree of protection of IP44 or be placed in an enclosure which has this rating. Lighting requires a minimum rating of IP54. And we can see that this socket outlet has been rated at IP56, which is more than adequate. Generally, any electric equipment shall be inaccessible to livestock. And this section provides clear diagrams to show the recommended clearance dimensions. I must point out that when looking at these diagrams, the dimensions are taken from the most sticky out bit and not the edge of the panel. The most sticky out bit? I've never seen that in definition. That's a new technical term, Dave. Well, I've just invented it, yes. Well, watch out for Amendment 2. Yeah, it will be there. Allowance must be made for switchgear doors and extractable units. In the open position, they must not impede on the evacuation route. More Throughout this video, we've referred to a number of appendices. These are located at the back of the book and provide additional information to the installation designer, installer and inspector. Although outside the main body of the regulations, Appendix 1 is normative, which means it's a requirement. All of the others are informative and are provided as guidance.